Thank you so much. It is such an honor uh, to be part of this lecture series and to get an opportunity to talk about our book that was officially uh, published and released in spring of this year. So um, <clears throat> we're going to start by talking about just a little bit of the background of the book um, and then we'll go we'll dive a little bit into um, what's what's all in the book and we'll end by answering any questions or uh, other things. We're gonna talk at the end a little bit about the publishing process because some people may be interested in that. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, we're more than happy to answer any of those. Um, but in addition to the introductions that we just did, um, we're gonna just briefly kind of talk about um, you know, how we were involved in this book process before we get started. So um, <clears throat> I am Dr. Bethany Novotny and um, I took uh, the point on uh, getting this book done. Uh, I will say that I could not have done this uh, without the help of Stacy and Michelle. Uh, I was approached in uh, the fall of 2018 um, by Kendall Hunt uh, Publishers about creating a book for this uh, specific class that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the thought of writing a book overwhelmed me and at the same time sounded very exciting and like something that we, you know, had already talked about uh, in the past with this particular class. So it seemed like a great opportunity, um, but uh, I knew that I couldn't do it um, without having some other folks on board. And so uh, I was really happy that Stacy and Michelle uh, both agreed to help in this process. And um, we can kind of each speak to a little bit about um, how that came to be and uh, what that process was like. But I'll just um, give each of them an opportunity to kind of talk about getting on board with the book. Stacey. Michelle? Uh, me, oh, okay. I'll go first. Um, you know, I, golly, it, I can't exactly remember uh, the conversation, but um, I had met Dr. Novotny a few months after she started with the university, and we were working on some projects together um, that really weren't turning our crank. Um, we weren't getting much satisfaction out of them. So um, this book opportunity came along and Dr. Novotny asked if, if I would be willing to help write the book because I've taught the course that it's for before. And um, I said, sure, absolutely. And it's been nothing but great fun since I said yes. I'll have to agree with Michelle. I've been teaching this class for a long time and um, had some contributions to the first um, office published book for the class. And it just wasn't cutting it for what we needed for the current class. You know, we just needed to update it. And so I clearly remember uh, Dr. Novotny approaching me on this while I was running down the steps in Sharon and she was running up and she said, hey, would you be up for it? And I'm like, hallelujah, I'm ready for a new book for this class. And it was really, you know, turnabout because I'd wrote Dr. Novotny into a New Mexico trip with students on diversity. And I felt like I couldn't tell her no because she had really pulled it out for that trip. And also very energized to work with these two individuals and would step up and volunteer to do that anytime with them. They're great colleagues to work with. So it was a really wonderful experience bouncing ideas off of them and developing a book that we felt like would really speak to the needs of our students in the class. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to follow up by uh, talking about that class specifically that we're, we keep referencing. So um, in the Department of Counseling and Human Services, we offer uh, a class called Solving the Puzzle of Life. And <clears throat> that class has been on the books for a long time. Um, and historically, we've offered um, 10 plus sections of the course each semester. Um, that has unfortunately decreased a little over time based on some financial aid restrictions and things. Um, but we, it's still a very popular class and one that um, students find um, very valuable in their process, um, in their developmental process as being a student. 
And so the, the Puzzle of Life course was really about um, personal growth and professional development through um, one's college career. And uh, initially, um, in my understanding, and Stacey or Michelle could correct me if I'm wrong, um, was developed by um, some folks out of the University Counseling Center. Um, and then whenever I arrived at ETSU in um, 2016, um, within the next year, uh, Dr. Steve Cockrum, who had been um, overseeing the implementation of this class for years, approached me and, and told me that he was getting ready to retire. And he uh, had a lot of, he poured a lot of heart and soul uh, into this class and into the version of the workbook that they had used for years um, that was, it was published in house. And, you know, he said, you know, there's an opportunity here. This class needs to be revamped. It needs to be updated. And, um, you know, if you get the opportunity to do so, I would strongly encourage you to do that because it may breathe some new life uh, into the course and make you know, students and instructors excited about it again. Um, and so that's what I feel like our task was. Um, after Dr. Crockram left, uh, it was about a year later, uh, I mentioned before, fall of 2018, that uh, I got an email from Kendall Hunt Publishers who identified the course as an opportunity for them um, to get a textbook, right, because we had um, you know, 200 students enrolled uh, every semester in this course and no formal textbook uh, that we used that was, that was published through a publishing company. Uh, and so I sat down uh, with the publishers and had some really uh, important things that uh, we wanted to see happen, such as like the cost of the textbook not being a barrier for students. Uh, and making sure that we could make it uh, really uh, interactive in the types of activities and things we wanted to include in the book. And so when we got that all squared away, um, we signed a contract and uh, it definitely took us longer than we expected, um, but we were able to finish uh, the book in 2020 and have it published in the spring of 2021. So that's kind of the background of the book and the solving the puzzle of life class. And can I throw in there, Bethany, for in my job, I'm the director of the University Advisement Center and we work with exploratory students. And because I've been teaching this class, I was actually using parts of the book and work with students. And so I actually wanted a textbook that we could buy for the advisors here that would have some exercises that actually paired and complemented our life design studio model that we're rolling out and working with this, these students and exploring. So it was gonna have outside of the classroom reach as well. And it was fairly selfish on my part. We were kind of tired of trying to creatively think of ways to work with these students. We wanted something that we could hold on to and share with them. And that this is part of why I was very excited about being part of writing this text. All right, so uh, Michelle, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my task is to introduce you to the first unit of the book. Um, there are five units and <clears throat> I have to give Stacy credit here. She came up with a really good approach and it was at each uh, unit was going to ask a question. Who am I? Why am I here? What assets do I have? Who is going with me and where am I going? And so each unit deals individually with those topics. The first unit um, is who am I? And we're going to use unit one to define your identity. Um, so we know that students um, are always looking to find themselves. They're trying to figure out who they are, where they fit in in life, and what they want to do. And so we've designed Unit 1 to help them answer some of those questions. Um, there's two chapters in Unit 1. And the first chapter is called Personal Identity Formation. 
And in this chapter, uh, the students will look at their values. They'll explore their personality type through the Myers-Briggs. Uh, they explore the concept of life balance. And we also talk about different types of communication and how to effectively communicate with others and identify your motivations, why you are uh, moving toward the path you're moving. Um, we have several different exercises in chapter one geared toward um, helping students learn more about their own identity. Um, one of the main ones is the Young Topology Test um, that's um, also known as the Myers-Briggs. And we have quite a lot of information about that in chapter one. Um, we always end the chapter with a, a reflection. And in that reflection, uh, we ask four questions. Um, I have clarified, fill in the blank. I have identified, fill in the blank. I understand, fill in the blank. And I'm more aware of, fill in the blank. So. We, we really try to have the students reflect a great deal on what they're reading and what they're doing. Um, I will quickly tell you that chapter two is on cognitive processes. And here is where we discuss critical thinking, awareness of a growth mindset, um, how we make decisions and solve problems, and the importance of curiosity and lifelong learning. And uh, we also have a, several exercises in this chapter and activities that was very important to us to keep the students focused um, and engaged. And that encompasses unit one. Um, and we will move on to unit two, which I believe is Stacy. That is me. So unit two picks up with a question of why am I here? So we hope that they have done some identification of in the unit one, just so that they understand who they are as a person. So then we want them to find a purpose and how to apply, apply that to, to their life. So they are in this unit um, working towards um, exploring their life purpose and, and needs of transcendence. Throughout that, this unit, we want them to, the goals are for them to increase their capacity for finding meaning and joy. And we have to actually help them define that. What do I, we ask questions like, what does that look like to you? What does finding meaning in your life look to you? What does joy look like to you? So, because we throw out these terms and you can see like they kind of just haven't really been challenged to think about those questions before. We want to talk to them in this unit about approaching life with gratitude, um, that's been a little bit of a challenge, I think, over the last year, at least I experienced in my class. Everyone was so consumed with COVID response that it was hard to sometimes maybe look for those little rainbows throughout the day. So we kind of focused on, then on what are you grateful for and, and the positives you want to build on that in your life. The other part of this, and then the, the transcendence part, is that there's others in the world. So we want them to explore the opportunities to serve others. And we don't talk about um, just, hey, it's a good idea to do it. There's a, a kind of a tool in there for them to figure out what is it they would like to do in their service of others? What do they enjoy doing in their community? And so that they will have an action plan. So throughout all these units, you'll get a sense of moving forward, not just thinking about it in here. We want them to live what they're learning in this book. And the exercises challenge them to make a plan. So we do say, how can you serve others? Um, if you can't help yourself, you can help somebody else maybe. So let's get out there and do that. And we help them come up with those kinds of things. Um, but at the end of that also, we want them to practice living with intent and to formulate some goals to do that in a big encompassing way. And we tell them they're gonna move all this forward through the end of these units. And in the, in the books, like Michelle said, at the end, there's the questions they answer. We like right in your book, because we're going to be working with these all throughout the class. So how can you live with intent and formulate goals to do so? The other section of this book talks about cultural responsiveness. 
and developing strong multicultural skills. Um, Dr. Novotny had a huge input to that. She's great at this stuff and challenged students to think about others and to get to know others and to ask questions and to learn stories and to see outside of themselves. Um, with the end result of all of this to be a challenge to activism and to put forward their best self and, to, and putting out in the world um, their meaning and joy in service to others. And that, that's the why am I here unit. Um, and I think we're up for three, and that's personal resources with Bethany. That's me. So unit three talks about um, assets and aptitudes. So this is coming from a strength-based approach. Um, what, do you, what do you have um, that will help you accomplish these things? And so it's kind of taking this introspective look um, at what kind of skills um, and resiliency that students already have built in that maybe they don't even haven't even identified yet. Um, so in, at the end of chapter one, uh, we talk about developing um, a life balance and um, what it means um, to practice wellness or strive for wellness in different areas of one's life. And so what I really appreciate about this book is that we wrote it to kind of intentionally revisit topics throughout the course um, so that students can really see their personal growth through the course. And so we talk about that at the end of chapter one, but they really dive deep into it in chapter five. And so it talks about assessing wellness and how we should really um, create a practice of being reflective and going and asking ourselves, how are we doing in these different areas of wellness? And we talk about emotional, social, intellectual, occupational, physical, and spiritual wellness. And these are, this is kind of called, referred to as the six dimensions of wellness model. And so in this chapter, students get an opportunity to really um, take notes and think about how am I tending, attending to this dimension of wellness in my life? Um, maybe I've really been neglecting um, my emotional uh, wellness, and maybe I'm um, you know, spending too much time um, in my, uh, you know, social wellness. I'm, I'm being so social that I'm like kind of missing out on my intellectual part, like not doing my work, uh, right? So students can kind of see like, where are things, where's my energy going? Uh, and is that in balance? Or are there some areas that really aren't being attended to? Uh, <clears throat> and then we also, um, we talk a little bit about like, uh, we don't, I don't think we say it directly, but we talk about like some cognitive beha behavioral therapy stuff. Um, so we talk about like distorted ways of thinking, um, challenging irrational thought patterns. Um, and there are some um, maladaptive thought patterns that we can fall into um, that may get in the way of our emotional wellness at times. Um, so, that's pretty much chapter five. Uh, oh, and then I'm sorry, at the end of chapter five, we also talk about resiliency. What does it mean to be resilient? What does that look like? Um, and then um, ways to build resilience uh, in one's life. And chapter six, that's the second chapter in unit three. And that talks about personal upgrades. Um, so that does dive a little deeper into cognitive behavioral therapy and how our thoughts influence our feelings and our behavior and um, how can we adapt to change uh, in a way that is um, healthy and positive. Um, we have students list their protective factors. And um, so what are kind of areas um, that I can draw from if I find myself in a position where uh, I'm needing some help uh, or I'm struggling in some area. And so they can actually literally write out a list and refer back to this if they find themselves in a position where they, they need to use some of their resources. <clears throat> and then we talk about information management and the myth of multitasking. Um, how are people using their time? And we talk about using time efficiently isn't always doing five things at one time, but in fact, that actually can make you a lot less productive in the long run. And uh, I've gotten some feedback from uh, students in the class and instructors 
um, in the class who have said that this has been a, a big eye opener for students to realize that they just need to slow down sometimes and do one thing at a time and have a, a really a more structured way of approaching uh, their time management. And so um, that tends to be a really, really uh, helpful topic uh, for students. And um, at the end of chapter six, we talk a little bit about um, information, uh, information overload, um, technology, what does cybersecurity look like? Um, and we don't dive deep into that, but in the age of, of social media and all of the information out there, um, we just felt like it was really important to at least um, kind of address that topic. And um, depending on the makeup of the class, um, kind of respond, to, you know, however the students see that need. Um, I just talked to my GA today who said that um, they're in their fourth class right now and they, they kind of talked about, they're doing values identification, you know, who am I? and um, and they, they already brought up social media, that who, who I am on social media isn't necessarily who I am, you know, when I'm face to face with somebody. So it's really integrated kind of throughout because this is, this is what our students are experiencing every day. So that's the end of chapter six. Okay, I have um, unit four, which has one chapter. Um, and I think that this is probably one of the more popular sections of the book because we're talking about who is going with me, uh, relationships and connections. And so in this unit, we um, look at how our relationships in life um, affect our ability to live life to the fullest. Um, and we also uh, look at the components that we've already talked about, again, revisiting some um, topics like decision making, values, um, goal setting that affect our relationships and connections. So in chapter seven, we are identifying important relationships. And in this chapter, we want to um, the students to explore their relationship with themselves first and how they can develop greater self-respect. Um, we want them to gain an understanding of their family of origin dynamics and rules that have shaped their interactions with their family and others. And we want them to understand components of a healthy relationship, um, fighting fair, uh, is something that we talk about, and ending relationships in a constructive way. Um, so in this chapter, we begin with Brothenbrenner, um, whose theory, uh, ecological theory, is very dynamic. It talks about how everything in your life is influential um, to some degree, and we explain that, and then we talk about the relationship to self. Um, we ask them to do a self-reflection exercise uh, that's about 25 questions, asking them some really tough questions, things they might not have thought about before. Um, and then we talk about finding your tribe. Um, everybody needs a tribe. And um, sometimes it's um, finding people who have common threads um, sometimes it could be your family or a group of friends, but we want the students to understand um, how to create an environment where they are their best selves. And we talk about healthy relationships. Uh, we give a lot of examples of what that looks like. Uh, we talk about the language of love. And then we also uh, highlight some things that are unhealthy so that students can recognize maybe if they're in a relationship that's not conducive to their best self. Um, we talk about communication, what's a good listener and maybe a bad listener, um, and types of communication such as assertive, aggressive, 
uh, passive aggressive and passive communication. And we ask them to give examples of that in their own lives. Um, we do touch on boundaries, uh, healthy boundaries that need to be set up to protect um, the student. And we also talk about, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, I missed a page. We also talk about um, how to set those boundaries and we have an activity for that. So this chapter is really geared toward um, helping the student analyze their relationships with a critical eye and improve them in ways uh, that they can and maybe recognize unhealthy relationships and how to remove themselves from those situations positively. Um, so that is chat, uh, unit four. So in unit five, the question, the driving question is, where am I going? Um, and, and boy, wouldn't we all like to know that. I will tell you that I always learn a new thing about myself when I'm teaching this class, and I'm maybe going to figure this out before I retire. But um, the first chapter in this, we call it Adulting 101. Um, <clears throat> we have a list, there's a list that we link them to. It's adulting skills. And um, these students who are telling us that they are adults, out of this list of skills, I think there's about 50 or so, they can do like five. And so we'll just do a whip around the room sometimes and say, okay, what is the name of your car insurance? My what? Who's, who do you go for dental appointments? How often do you go? What? I mean, they don't have the real adulting skills. They have the adulting skills of maybe not living at home anymore, but maybe mom's still doing the laundry. So we do talk about adulting 101. And I think maybe we forgot to say at the beginning of each chapter, we have like an overview of the chapter and what we hope they'll learn, and then the critical skill development that they hope that they get out of each chapter. So in this chapter, this is about the Adulting 101 and also career readiness, because the point of coming to college is to get a job, not to just to college, it is to job. So um, we talk about um, link them to university career services, talk about resume skills, interview skills, job search skills, and that's kind of the, the bulk of chapter eight. We also do talk about financial wellness. Um, we felt very strongly about that. I do as an advisor see many students that are, their financial health after two years at our institution is abysmal. And they, they're they signing loans, they don't know what they're signing. They look on their ETSU account and see they have, oh, zero dollars. I'm like, good, but you owe the bank 15,000. You understand how that works, right? No, they did not. They just said, if I sign these papers, my debt to ETSU will be paid. And oh my goodness. So we felt very strongly that we wanted them to be strong consumers and um, keepers of their financial health. So we consulted with um, a financial planner and they gave us some tips to put in the book. So that's the bulk of chapter eight is to get them ready to interview, but hopefully to develop and identify the adulting skills and actually what are those adulting skills. And if your answer to that skill list is my mama does it, then you are not an adult. When you can answer all those questions fully, then we will call you a, a colleague of an adult. So we want them to get there. Um, chapter nine is probably um, where we wanted to put the most time into a, a real active plan. So chapter nine is really putting all of this together. So we go back to the very beginning and there's worksheets in this chapter for them to pull all of those, um, I think Michelle read to you, the end of chapter key questions that I have clarified, I have identified, I, ha I understand and I'm more aware of all of their responses for each chapter. There's a worksheet for them to write all those responses down and look through them to see what are you seeing a theme to your response? Are you seeing a theme to what you're trying to work through in this class. We asked them to revisit their value statements. Way back in chapter one, they did a values exercise and they came up with their top three values. We allow them to have more values in their life than three. Hope they do have more than three, but they do work through the three values and they do have a sentence. Um, I'm gonna read you the sentence. Um, and for their top values, they write this sentence. 
I choose or want to live my life in a way where, and you plug in the value, is exampled by, and then we want them to put in examples of what they are doing in their life that show that that is a value to them. Um, and they really struggle with that, and we want them to struggle with that because we want them to think about that, but we help them craft those sentences. So in Chapter 9, we ask them to go back to those value statements and say, are you living those value statements? Because that may be why you're happy or not happy with your life. Um, we go back to the six dimensions of wellness. Are you having good life balance? If so, why? If, so, if not, how can you fix it? Um, we do also ask them about light bulb moments. Throughout the book, we ask them, are you having any light bulb moments, things that aren't in the book that you thought of, write them down and put them into the plan. After that, they, we pull all that information together and talk them through it and ask them to create a life map or a life plan. Um, we give them some instruction on how that can be done, but it can be done any way that has meaning to a student. I teach the late start section, so um, I don't have my students write as much as the other sections do because we're in a time crunch. So my students actually meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, which people do not have the luxury of doing that. My classes are smaller. They do a one-on-one -on -one presentation, and they have a life map, and we, they walk me through it, and I give them feedback. I also give them feedback on the reflections they've done throughout the class, and it's just them and myself. There are no other people in the class there. And for my class, the late start class, they're usually students that are super struggling. They're wiping out of another major, so they've had to add my class. They're struggling otherwise. So I, I kind of get a little more specialized population. Um, that time, that one-on-one -on -one time with them, it's a 20-minute presentation. They always run over because they want the feedback. And if I don't give them the feedback, they'll go, okay, you said you were going to tell me that you, about some feedback that you had from my reflection. So I feel like they are just craving that one-on-one -on -one time with an instructor. So um, time aside, it's very worth it in the class. And in, in the late start class, I would continue. I don't know that the other instructors with that number of students could do it, but in the late start, we do that. But we wanna see their plan. I don't require them to write a huge paper on it. It can be a collage, it can be a painting, it can be a whiteboard, it can be any infographic, they, but they do have to present it and they do have to have the uh, professional presentation skills. They cannot use their phone um, as a presentation tool. That's the only like parameter I set. And um, they do have to fill the 20 minutes. I've never had trouble with that. In fact, I've had to cut them off because Students were either waiting outside the classroom or in the Zoom room to come in and start their presentation after half an hour. But it's, it's very enjoyable and I do like that part. Um, and I do feel like that's a good opportunity for me to give them feedback that I might not feel comfortable doing not one-on-one -on -one or, or not in person, or as in person as Zoom could be. And they um, like that sounding board moment. Um, in the book, there are empty pages at the back where they can like make notes and do stuff. This is intended to be written on and work through. I'm just flipping through it right now. Um, I will have to say, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the publishing process. When we're doing this book, we wanted it to be interactive and engaging. And so we used a lot of pictures and inserts. I bet we spent more time in Shutterstock choosing the absolute perfect picture because we love so many. And we had a really good time choosing the pictures to, to accompany the text, so that was really fun, but we hope that that helps kind of kind of center their minds when they go in. Um, in, in this part of the book, it's, and we do talk a lot about um, the values. We really want them to do that value-driven life. So um, they are also welcome to do personal add-in. For my students, I pull in information that might be helpful to them from other classes I teach. I teach a class on the nature principle and how reconnecting with nature is healthy and beneficial. And I throw that out there. We talk about the works of Turkle. Um, I believe that um, you heard, we were talking about multitasking and then social media and its impact. And so I introduced them to the works of Turkle and reclaiming conversation in the digital age. They all resonate with that. And I noticed when the, the word multitasking is a myth was mentioned, everyone smiles. And my students all, they do that. We do an exercise in the class where I have them 
multitask and do something and grade them on it, every one of them fail it when they're multitasking. But when they're doing that one task, they're like, dang, Dr. Ong. So um, we, we want to give them some life skills in this final chapter that they can move forward, but also the skill to continue to retool their lives with this book and with what they learn from the book at each stage of their life, because they, they'll need to do it. It's not a one-off. So that's unit five. Oh, go ahead, Bethany. Yeah, I was just going to say that kind of concludes like walking through what's all included in the book. And Michelle is going to um, quickly kind of run through some of the publishing tips that we came up with as part of our experience. And then we'll open it up for questions right after that. Yes, I will do this as quickly as possible. And what I'll do is send this to uh, Chelsea and Heidi, and perhaps they can send it out to those that have attended, uh, since we won't be able to go over it in much detail. But um, the, the tips are divided up into a couple different areas. How to develop an idea for your manuscript um, is the first one. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to move this. Sometimes I'm not. Okay. Yes, I am. Um, the next part talks about the actual writing process, um, navigating authorship, and um, finding out where to submit your manuscript, uh, submission and review, and other advice. And the other advice I just want to spend is just a second on, these are things that, that we personally encountered um, in the process and want to remind you of if you decide to publish. First of all, get everything in writing. Save your emails uh, to and from your publisher and any other forms that you encounter. Um, that way there's no question about what was decided uh, between you and the publisher. Always have a legal team and the one at the university is willing to do this. Review your publishing contract before signing it. Stand your ground. If the publisher is demanding things that are unreasonable, um, talk with them. Tell them I'm not. That's not going to work for me. I'm too. I'm too caught up this fall semester to finish the book in December. I need an extension. Talk to them. Communicate regularly with your editor. Keep them apprised of your progress and your obstacles. Oftentimes, they can assist you. They can help you remove those obstacles that are in your way. Finally, don't expect to get rich unless you have a bestseller. <laughs> uh, learn how your royalties will work and what you can expect as far as payment. And be sure to learn who owns your work, you or the institution. Uh, that should be done on the front end. So those are just a few tidbits of advice. I will pass these along uh, for you to have um, as, a, as a Word document. Am so, I frozen? Go ahead. Am I frozen? Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're good. It said my internet connection was not stable. Um, one, one other tip I would add is uh, to be very clear with the publisher about the budget. Um, whatever the budget is that they have available, um, it varies from book to book. And that had a huge impact in what we could include uh, in terms of uh, getting access to uh, resources and co you know copyright um, things. So, um, the book budget is something to really talk about up front, and uh, some of the things can be very costly and can eat up a big part of the budget. And so I think that that should be a very big conversation, um, especially if you're if you're thinking about including outside resources. I think uh, we would be open for questions now if anybody has. Um, thoughts or questions? Wow, thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I, I guess if anybody else has questions, 
please jump in. But I was just thinking about that last point that you raised, um, Bethany, because I do film studies. And so image copyright and how much that costs and where you can get stills um, is always like the final thing that everybody forgets about and then sinks your book project. So I think that's a really important point. Of Chelsea, if I may, of... <laughs> We ran into a, Dan Westover and I uh, published a book recently, and we ran into a situation where a couple of the authors wanted to offer a quote before the, the chapter itself began, and the publisher uh, discussed that as ornamentation. If, if it had been material that had been incorporated in the chapter and, and analyzed, then we had clearance for it, but because it was ornamentation, they wanted royalties or to make certain that we paid royalties for anything that, that appeared above the chapter number. So we basically had to work with the uh, contributors to the text to make sure that uh, those quotes got moved in and got worked into, into the text itself. So I, I would suggest you keep that kind of thing in mind as well as, as you progress. Wow, I hadn't heard of that. That's uh, wild. I hadn't either. <laughs> anyone else have any questions? I know they also have an exercise for us. So you can ask questions or we could exercise. I have a, I have a quick question. Um, one, I, well, a comment and a question as, as we do. One, love the book. Um, two, I'm going to put a link to the book in the chat if folks want to check it out, maybe buy it for yourselves or consider adopting it for your classes. And then my question is, Stacy, I love the idea of that multitasking exercise. <laughs> I'm wondering if that is in the book or if that's something you developed on your own and if you would be willing to share that. I will double check. That was one of those things that um, we did not get permission always to use all these resources we wanted. So we share that resource among the instructors, but I'll be glad to look that up um, and share that with you. Thank you. So just from an advising perspective, since I advise a lot of students, who, if I'm looking at students, who would you want me to put in your class? Um, from, from my seat, if they are really waffling, they have been through the ETSU 1020 or some other first year experience course, um, and they need to take it to a next level. And they just are kind of at a crossroads of knowing what they want to do and how they want to do it. This is a great class for that. If they have free electives, I've had seniors in my class that like, oh my gosh, I need three more hours to graduate. Can I be in your class? I'm like, well, you're a senior, but they're like, they always say, I wish I'd taken this class earlier. So it really does speak to a wide range of students. And it does help students that just are, just cannot sort out what they want to be when they grow up. I would um, just piggyback off of that to say, um, this, this course can be helpful to anybody that comes in with an open mind. Um, I've had a few students reach out to me, uh, non-traditional students who thought, you know, is this like a class for just a traditional like undergraduate student, freshman, sophomore? And, you know, I, I kind of gave them, you know, some ideas to think through to see if it was right for them. Uh, and they ended up taking the class and finding it really beneficial. So um, it's something that I feel like can really be helpful to anyone. Um, I also <clears throat> want to say that um, I didn't include, because the book's so new, we didn't have a ton of um, uh, comments from the evaluations yet, but a few that I can remember off the top of my head um, that we get all the time is uh, like, I love this class, everyone should have to take this class is a pretty common one. Uh, one student last semester also wrote that they bought additional copies of the book to give to their family members as gifts. Um, so that is, it's something I think that we had thought about. You know, we were really um, student focused. Uh, even the cover art 
uh, was actually designed um, by one of our former students. So um, we really, I think that we really, from start to finish, we designed this book really intentionally for our students. Um, and if it can be used in a broader sense, that's great. Um, but it's, it's really something that we put a lot of heart and soul into so that it would benefit as many of our students as possible. I was going to say, Bethany, I really love the cover art. And, and where did that come from? Because it, it's just, it's very beautiful. I, I wonder if, and thank y'all so much for, for your presentation today and for doing this work and creating this book so other people can other people can benefit from it as well. I'm, you know, I keep, I hear a lot, I've kind of listened to a lot of the sections from the, from a more organizational perspective. And I'm wondering if, if y'all thought about doing this book as workshops for um, departments or programs on campus. I mean, I could, I could see how some identity formation, goal setting, and action planning um, could be great to go through with um, with my colleagues. I will say from my director seat, um, when things get a little hot over here or we get a little discouraged with, I don't know, you've been working really hard with students and things aren't kind of going well, we go, we do that values exercise and revisit their individual values and why they're showing up for work every day and kind of get them back on track and then do that six dimensions of wellness. Maybe work has taken too much out of you and that's why you're not feeling. So I, in my office, I have used these exercises just to refocus because I have a great team of people and I really want to keep all of them. And sometimes they just need a breather and to kind of remember why we're showing up every day. And some of these exercises speak really well to the professionals here. So that's a great idea. And did Tony, you want we, to walk us did, through? I'm just oh. Oh, go ahead. Hmm? I was just going to say, do you want to walk us through at least one of the, the exercise that you have pulled up on the slides or? I think it's going to make me stop share and then reshare every time. Or not. I have several monitors here, and so it's just really annoying. Can you see? Are you seeing still the book cover? No, we can see the six dimensions of wellness page. It just okay, has good. all the PowerPoint stuff around it still, but. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's just the other sheet. So, um, Bethany, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so essentially um, what we would have you do is kind of write down each of the six dimensions. Um, so if you didn't jot those down before when I went through them, um, I'll just say those again. So the first one is emotional, social, intellectual, occupational, physical, and spiritual. And what Stacy has pulled up here is a description of each. So students would be able to read what about each dimension and what that means. Um, for the sake of time, we won't go into that. But what we would have you do in the activity is briefly jot down um, some statements about how you're doing in these areas. Um, if you feel like you've really been attending um, to your spiritual wellness, um, how are you doing that right now? Uh, or your emotional wellness or social wellness. If there's an area that you feel like you're struggling, what has that looked like? How has that manifested in your life? Maybe some problems that have come about because of that. And so you would take your time to kind of brainstorm in each dimension um, some things that either you're doing really well or you may be struggling with. And can I ask, is this um, actually a page from the book or is that something you put together just for the presentation today? Um, this is a page from the book. So this is kind of um, um, what it looks like. 
Cool. Yeah, I was curious, um, you know, just kind of what the what the layout of the book is. Um, but later you mentioned that it was meant to be written in, but I was kind of, you know, wondering what that actually looks like when it's like, okay, here's a book. And I see the spiral binding, which is really, what a great move. Yeah, that was another thing that we um, requested um, because we really wanted this to be something that students would take with them and refer back to um, later, uh, even potentially after they're graduated and left us at ETSU. Um, we also included in the book um, QR codes where we were not able uh, to do some uh, activities because of cost uh, limitations. And so like on this same page, students can actually use their phone uh, to use this QR code and go and fill this out online. Um, so we did some workarounds to where budget um, issues came into play. And also, you know, right, integrated some technology that students are really used to these days, um, but kind of was a different approach for us. That is such a great idea. Yeah, I agree with Heidi. Makes it so much more accessible for students. Wow. Yeah, I, I, now I want to physically see this book. Um, is it in our bookstore? Is it just around? It is. Um, we. We offer sections of the course every semester, uh, so there should always be copies available in the bookstore. Uh, it can also be purchased through that link that Heidi put. Uh, the book is uh, $36.75. Um, so it's pretty affordable when you think about textbooks these days. Um, and um, we also usually have some copies in our office. Um, so if you would wanna like stop in 303 in Wharf Pickle, and just flip through it to kind of see what it's all about. Um, you're welcome to do that too. Thank you. Are you thinking about doing like an ebook version at any point or shifting it to that model at all? Or is the physical book? Um, we do have an ebook available. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I think we kind of wanted to stick with the physical book, give them something to touch, give them something to hold on to, give them something to write in. Um, but I imagine that, you know, in the online sections, an ebook would, would be okay. But our intention was for them to really just dive, dive into this book, dog ear it, write notes, pull things out that they need to pull out. Um, so I think we've accomplished that. Great. Wonderful. So we've got about one minute left. Does anybody have any final questions or do our speakers have any final thoughts, plugs for the book? What's next? Um, I was going to say that I have a extra copy, uh, that, that I would be happy, uh, to get signed by Dr. Onx and Dr. Novotny and myself and contribute to your library if you'd like one. Absolutely, that would be amazing. Um, yeah, oh, okay. Well, it's coming through with the ebook information as well. <laughs> I always am curious about ebook options. Wow, well, I wanna be cognizant of our time, but Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I, I feel like I also was nodding along at points and being like, I could use that. I could probably do some of those exercises <laughs> right now. Sure, I know who has my car insurance, but like, you know, some of the other stuff, uh, <laughs> maybe I could spend some time with um, even as an adult, uh, theoretically. So um, thank you all for coming. Thanks for everybody who participated. And thank you guys again for sharing, sharing this book with us. This is so exciting. And congratulations. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us.